welcome you all to the Milton City Hall at 7.30. And I'm going to call the meeting of Milton Common Council for January 15th, 2019 to order. All right. So the first item on the agenda is the roll call. Kuhn? Here. Burke? Present. West? Present. Olson? Here. Ramsey? Here. Richard? Here. Steele? Is here somewhere. Is here somewhere and Sullivan is absent. Okay. So the next item is the comments from the citizens present. It's limited to three minutes per speaker. And I have uh, Michael Hahn. He's going to be the first one to speak. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Members of the City Council, uh, my name is Michael Hahn. I am uh, an attorney um, with Axley Brennelson. I represent um, Orchid Garden Center and uh, Kent, its owner, Kent Franz. Um, I'd like to just speak very briefly um, regarding a couple of agenda items uh, related to the final plat approval of the Red Tail Acres uh, subdivision. Um, there are up for up for uh, discussion and approval tonight is the final plat with various conditions um, and um, approvals uh, that uh, are are before the the council. What I'm here to speak on is relating to the easements that my client has for access to the property. There's two separate easements: one from County Q, and that allows access to the uh, to the garden center and then another one that is for ingress and egress around from the east side or the front side of the property around to the north so that he can access the back side of the property that's used primarily for um, deliveries come in for soil plants wood chips all the stuff that you would normally think of for a garden center that comes in gets dropped off in the front on the east side, and then that easement, it's a 20-foot gravel road that is used to access the back. With the final plat, that easement essentially is taken and eliminated in favor of a public roadway. Our concern is that we have a current easement for that for, to access our our property, now that's going to be no longer exclusive and over public roadways. And it's not, public roadways really aren't consistent with the use of what that easement is. It's used for, it's used by um, forklifts, bobcats, um, track, you know, with tracked and wheeled um, forklifts to carry wood chips, plants, trees, all sorts of stuff, like I said, that you would find in a greenhouse from the front to the back. If this goes through as currently configured, we're now driving those, that equipment on public streets. And if we aren't able to drive across public streets to do that, we essentially have lost our ability to move product from one side of the building to the other. And in our opinion, that's, that's a taking of our easement if we can't do that and if we're not allowed to do that. And I, unfortunately, while the city staff has been very responsive and very helpful in trying to work through this, we don't have a good solution at this point for it other than at this point, well, it's up to the police department as to whether or not they would issue any citations for any violations that would cause as a result of um, us using our easement. And we don't want to be in that position. And we hope that that's something that would be that the city council considers in its final plat approval that that's going to cause a serious harm to the business. And uh, we hope that that's taken into account. Thank you, Michael. So, any so, but you will be able to use the road if it's available, right? Well, it we'd be able to use the road as any other member of the public, mm -hmm. but uh, our use of the easement 
property isn't what any normal member of the public would use it for. We don't use it, we use it to transport equipment. It's, it's often dirty and uh, muddy business. And that would be, instead of being confined to a nice private easement, now that's going to be on public roadways and uh, potentially cause uh, issues for not only us, but also the future residents of the subdivision. Okay, thank you, Michael. Thank you. So the next one is Sarah Kolb. Hi, um, my name is Sarah Kors. I live at 6714 Franklin Avenue. Um, I'm here to talk to you tonight or ask you about an item that's much later on the agenda, the ordinance to require sign postings on rezoning, conditional use, and variance applications. Um, first, I want to commend the LNO um, committee and the council for recommending the sign posting on actual sites to be rezoned. That's important. People driving by, people walking by will see it. That will be notification in the neighborhood. Um, I'm disappointed to see that the notification area is still in the language as 100 feet. Um, if you'll remember from last year, it caused a lot of distress in my neighborhood um, about the Addison product project. Even though you said that the notification went out 200 feet, a lot of people felt kind of blindsided, and that was not sufficient notice to enough people that were going to be affected. Um, actually, I was talking to my neighbor. He works for the Department of Transportation, and he was telling me when they look at projects and they have things to be fixed, they don't. They have a set area, but they also look at streets around and they kind of consider on a case-by-case -case basis, although I know that's a lot of work, who's going to be affected, and they reach out. Because as he put it, they want the stakeholders to be involved, and they don't <coughs> want to get calls after the fact. Um, I just want you to consider perhaps a little wider notification area or changing the language to say not less than 100 feet, keeping in mind that you know maybe we could do more on a case-by-case -case basis or just make it a little bit more notice. Um, I know you're sitting here thinking local crankpot just wants to be informed so she can fight things, but I think if you did more notification, the stakeholders in the neighborhood would be better able to work with you and the developers on a front end. Um, and I think that's something you want Middleton to be known for. There's rumblings, I hear things in town that the perception, rightly or wrongly, is that the council committees are not responsive to residential people who already live here concerns. And I think working on something like this would make it a little more um, be a good PR move to show that you are interested because I know you are. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. So the next one is Danny Febo. Okay, so you don't want to speak. Oh, okay. 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 That he's here. So. Okay. Anyone else who wants to speak? Sure, go ahead. Sorry, I <clears throat> got here a little late. I'm in the process of filling this out. Uh, I'm here to speak on the proposed uh, increase. Oh, you want to in the identify fee. yourself and your address? Oh, my name's Charles Myers, uh, 7007 Century Avenue. <clears throat> I'm here to speak against the proposed increase in a fee. It's not the first time that this body has decided to raise a fee. I suspect it's not going to be the last because there are a number of people here who haven't had their property taxes go up. Well, my assessment's gone up 31% in the last two years since I've moved here. And for me, hearing it's just $30, it's just $50, every two or three months, by the time that you get <laughs> to <laughs> the end of this year, you're, gonna, you're going to have raised my property taxes effectively by 40% because none of, none of the people here, with some exceptions, can be bothered to budget according to their means instead of according to their wants. And I think you should all be ashamed if you vote for that. Thank you, Charles. Anyone else who wants to speak? Anyone else who wants to speak? Okay, I'm going to close that part of the mm, council, and now we are going to the, the public hearing. It's 7:35. Yeah, it is. Yep. So, for the Helbex Cafe LLC, doing business as Helbex Coffee House, is requesting a Class B 
fermented malt beverage and class B intoxicating liquor license. They're located at 1824 Parliamentary Street. Anybody who wants to speak either in favor or against it? Anybody who wants to speak? All right, so we are going to close the public hearing part of this one here, and then we are move on to the presentations. And the first presentation is on the Youth Center, Milton Craft Pillania School District presentation. Yes, we need the computer again. Yep. Hello, my name is Gabrielle Hanahara, and I'm the director of the Middleton Youth Center. I'm here today to provide you all with an update on our new program model that you may remember we launched at the beginning of this school year. So we're about four months in. And some of the key elements of this new model were we added a one-on-one -on -one staff and student mentoring program. We added one to two weekly mini courses per day. And we added a high school job training and paid internship program. Um, I am going to slide through things pretty quick here because I don't want to be disrespectful of your time, um, but please feel free to jump in and ask questions or ask questions at the end also. So starting with an overview of the mentoring program, each of our staff members is responsible for mentoring between 6 to 15 individual students, and at the beginning of the school year, students were given a choice of which staff member they would be matched with. Each staff member has one designated day per week that they're focusing on their student mentor meetings instead of running activities. And sometimes we also do time sensitive behavior meetings during the school day at Cromrie um, when we don't have the time to do them during the after school program. The mentor meetings are focused on relationship building, goal setting, behavior planning, academic accountability, and teaching self care practices. And they also help staff to identify students and families who are in need of additional resources and support. Um, so we are focused the mentoring program on students who regularly attend the youth center on average three days per week or more. Currently we have 55 students participating in the mentoring program. 60% of them are students of color. 57% are low income and 26% have IEPs or individualized education <coughs> plans with the school district. Staff aim to meet with their mentees once every other week or more. And so far before this week, we have had 298 individual mentor meetings with students. So on a qualitative level, um, behavior intervention um, and planning is one of the big things we're trying to do at the mentor meetings. So I just wanted to share one example here to help kind of wrap your head around what this might mean. Um, so this is kind of an anecdote that one of my staff members shared with me for this presentation. She wrote that one student, Alex, is often exhausted emotionally and physically. So it helps to give him frameworks to understand his mental health. And his mentor had to talk with him about spoons, which is an idea about disability that acknowledges how people have a certain amount of energy and ability to do things every day. And Alex tends to have a lower number of spoons than his mentor, who tends to have a higher number. So they had this conversation together, and a week later, Alex was having a bad day, and he came to up to his mentor and asked if he could borrow a spoon from her. So like getting that support from her to help him get through the end of his day. So it's a framework that this is just one example of how this made a difference in him recognizing his mental health and his exhaustion and how he can use others to support him when he needs it. On a quantitative level, um, I got some recent information from the school district. So this is um, analyzing students who are currently involved in the mentor program. So last school year, before we were doing the mentoring, uh, we had two students uh, in the mentoring program who had between five to nine in-school in school suspensions. And so far in the first half of this year, there's one student who's had less than five suspensions. So it appears to be a significant drop. For out-of-school suspensions last year, there was one student with less than five and four students with between five to nine. 
And so far in the first half of this year, two students have had less than five and one student has had between five to nine. So we're obviously only halfway through the school year, but it looks like potentially the mentor program is making a difference in suspension numbers. We're also working on academics through the mentoring. So it allows for individualized academic planning with students, helping them to set and achieve their goals. So one example is actually one of the students that I mentor, Elizabeth. Um, we found out that she was weeks behind in her math homework. And so I helped her to make a daily plan of during the after school program, how many extra assignments she was gonna do every day until she was caught up. And we communicated this with her teacher. So her teacher knew when to expect all the missing assignments. And later her teacher emailed me and said, the work you're doing with Elizabeth is amazing. Thank you so much for helping her with her homework. I can see how much it's helping her with her confidence. You're making a big difference. So some of this too is like, Elizabeth needed a lot of one-on-one -on -one feedback every day and encouragement, because um, it's a lot of work to do all those worksheets every single day. Um, so getting that specialized attention was really helpful <laughs> for her. Some qualitative data on the academics. Um, this is kind of tricky because last year, Cromer used a different standardized test than they used this year. So it's a little hard to compare between the two. Um, and even if we wanna compare between the beginning of the school year and winter, um, we, they have not administered all of the winter star standardized tests yet. So we don't really have a lot of data here. But what I, I did want to share with you is that we know that those 55 students we're mentoring do have high academic needs that we are working to address. 45% of them were below proficient in reading when they were tested this fall, and 38% of them were below proficient in math. We're also identifying a lot of other needs through the mentoring program and just having that one-on-one -on -one space to talk with the students. So these are a few examples. Um, we've identified one family that struggles to meet its food needs. So we've created a partnership with Middleton Outreach Ministry to be able to pack weekly food bags to send home with those students. We're also finding a lot of social emotional needs. You can see the quote here from one of our staff members um, talking with problems through problems at home and school, helping them work through their problems and communicate their feelings in a better way. Um, immigration's also been a big topic, especially this fall with all the ICE activity. So again, um, finding that some of our students have parents and families who are dealing with immigration and legal issues and just giving them that support and outlet to be able to talk to another adult outside of their family about those concerns and hopefully connect them with some resources also. So we also started mini courses this fall. Um, the main difference is that we before had all drop-in activities um, and mini courses run weekly for one month and students sign up at the beginning of the month and commit to going for about four sessions for the month, which allows for longer term projects, skill building, better program planning, and also more involvement with students in the design and implementation of the courses. So in the first semester, 58 different students participated and signed up for mini courses. We offered 20 different mini courses, which you can see some of the examples here, which is a much more diverse program offering than we had when we had all drop-in courses, which tended to kind of repeat the same day of the week every week. So every month, staff and students are coming up with new courses for the next month. Three of our mini courses this past semester were planned and co-led by Youth Center students and four more student-led mini courses are in development for this um, spring. We also piloted a high school job training and paid internship program, which was the goal was to target students who had graduated from the youth center and were now in high school, uh, or high school students who volunteer at the youth center. They are responsible for leading or co-leading at least one activity every week. They receive professional development and support from Youth Center staff to build their skills as youth workers. And this is part of our larger goal to provide more support for our Youth Center kids once they graduate eighth grade and age out of our program, and also to grow our own diverse staff team that's more representative of the students that we serve. So the results of this is we started with one high school intern, Akshita, who was he's a sophomore at Middleton High School and was previously volunteering with our Girls Inc. program. 
This fall, she led a one-month photography mini course. She provided staff support for a two-month Makers Club program, and she's currently leading a one-month Bollywood dance mini course. And by request of one particular student that she got close with, she's also mentoring one student. So I asked Akshita to share some of her experience with you. So these are all direct quotes from her that she wrote to me. Um, but I think the main thing to recognize here is I think the quality um, of like the role models that she's getting from our other staff and the skills that she's developing as a youth worker are pretty exceptional for a high school student. It's a lot different than like a fast food job experience. Um, she's really learning how to make her own decisions with the kids to communicate effectively, to help them resolve their conflicts and to be around like a pretty dynamic group of six other college age and older staff who are really passionate about this line of work. <coughs> I also wanted to pro provide an update on enrollment. Um, I've shared you this with you before, but you can see here the pretty steady increase in our daily attendance numbers since we reopened in 2014. What's interesting to note is in 2018, our average per day jumped up to 48 students, and that's even considering the fact that we had a wait list that was limiting attendance for seven of the 12 months in 2018. So for an overview, our goal ratio is one staff per 10 students in our activities and homework room, plus that additional staff member that's focused every day on the one-on-one -on -one mentoring. So this works out to about 40 students Monday through Thursday, which is when we're open during the summer when we have four staff, and 50 students Monday through Thursday and 40 students on Fridays during the school year. In summer 2018, this is the first time that we really felt the need for a wait list, and this is why. The first three days of the summer program, the attendance numbers were 63, 66, and 65, and this is with four staff members. So we enrolled everybody who had their enrollment paperwork completed and were attending <coughs> by the end of the first day, which was 101 different students. And then there were 10 additional students that enrolled later that we added to the wait list, and luckily, this summer, we were able to give all 10 of those students a spot in the program in mid-July, which was halfway through our summer program. After that experience, we knew that enrollment for fall was going to be similar, so we tried to plan ahead. We contacted all previously enrolled families in August and asked them to confirm that they wanted to enroll and renew their enrollment um, for the fall, which guaranteed them a spot in the after-school program. In fall, the first three days, our attendance was 64, 65, and 70 we hit for the first time. And there were 95 students who either signed up ahead of time or we also kind of let every kid who came that first week kind of be grandfathered in because there were a lot of families who, then the wait list was new, so we were kind of trying to be a little flexible and still let in our regular kids. And we were able to enroll an additional 13 students from the wait list in October and November as spaces opened up. Um, Cromery's after school clubs and sports usually get started a little farther into the fall, so that usually brings our attendance numbers down a little bit. Uh, we do currently have 33 students still on our wait list, and we haven't been able to enroll any new students since November. Um, our numbers are, have been very steady, just over 50 per day, so it's unlikely that there's going to be any new spots for kids on the wait list at all, or very few, and then we'll start a new enrollment session in April for the summer. Um, in our current enrollment, 53% of students are low income, and 69% of students on the wait list are low income. So clearly, this is a group of kids we wish we could providing could be providing after school services for. Uh, along with that, we have made some plans and some progress, I would say, in our fundraising over the last few years. Last year, we raised just under $7,000 in fundraising, and all of this goes toward part-time staff that helps us increase our capacity for students in the program. So far in 2019, we've raised about 4,500, 1,500 of that in individual donations, and then we participated in the Greater Madison Youth Initiative Survey and won second place for the number of surveys we generated. So we got $2,000 from that. 
And then we got a surprise $1,000 donation from the Greater Milwaukee Foundation that I still don't know why we got, but I will <laughs> accept. Um, somebody recommended us for it, but I'm not sure who. So. Um, so like I said, this is being used to supplement our staff. Um, about 6,500 of it for 500 hours of part-time after-school staffing, about 13 hours per week. That also includes the high school internship program. And then about 1,500 for a 300 hour summer AmeriCorps position. Some future considerations. Uh, we also just wanted to let you know that we do have a meeting scheduled with um, administration in the school district for early February to discuss the future home of the youth center. You may have seen that in the school referendum that was last passed, Clark Street Community School will be transitioning in the next few years to a 4K building. Um, at which point stuff will not be sized appropriately for middle school students anymore. Um, so I'm kind of thinking Cromery might be the likeliest future home of the youth center since we're already serving all students from Cromery, but that's not something that's been discussed or approved with the school district at this time. Um, we could increase our capacity to serve students a little bit, I think, because at Cromery we would have access to gym space, which we currently don't. And we've actually already been piloting this winter a drop-in basketball program one day a week at Cromery's gym that's been serving between 15 to 17 youth center students and could probably go up to about 20, which is more than our current sports limit of around 12 in the like commons room at Clark Street that we try to make a gym at times. So that is my update. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, of course, for your support of the Youth Center over all of these years. Um, it's a pleasure to run this program. Well, great job. It looks like uh, it's really working, your uh, new program. And uh, the Cromery was supposed to be the center for Youth Center, if you remember. It was part of it. But uh, um, so it will be OK if it goes back there. So yeah. Any I'll just pass or? these around too, um, not because I'm asking for your individual donations, but this is the uh, youth center like fundraising mailer we sent out right before the holidays, and it has some good information too on some like 2017, 2018 numbers. So I have extras, so I'll just pass them around. Any questions, Joanna? Gabriel, um, are we at the point where we should consider um, a larger um, support system for the youth center, like a Boys and Girls Club or affiliation with some of the larger clubs that are kind of national in scope that might bring fundraising, bring more um, staffing ability? Or is this too organic that you don't want to have an outside group that has that kind of profile come in? So I'm just curious if the youth uh, commission has talked about that. Yeah, that's, it's a good question, and it's not something that the Commission on Youth or myself have really talked about seriously. Um, I do, I would worry about, like, having an outside group just that has, like, their own national priorities involved, because I think that's been one of the things that's been great about working and running the Youth Center is since we are such a small group, we can see exactly what's going on at Cromery and what the needs are, and we respond to it really quickly. Like, we have slightly altered our program model every single year, and I think it's gotten stronger and stronger every year. So I would personally just have concerns about how much ability we would have to still, like, make those decisions how we and run things how we want to run them. Um, but I do think we are at a point where we need to be, like, getting more creative and involved in like other ways <laughs> to bring in resources and support for the program. Yeah. Yes, Robert. <coughs> had an agreement with all of this as well. I saw that. And, and we invited Percy to come and talk about because we really have some really good information about particularly the students that we are serving through the youth center aren't necessarily students that we're serving in other programs and has had some really good information about serving students of color, serving students of a different socioeconomic status. So we wanted him to come and kind of support us as well because we've been really working together to see how we can move forward to be able to meet a lot of these needs. Okay, so Robert has a question and then Percy, so. I, I guess I just wanted to say, um, I'm even on the Commission on Youth and I learned some things tonight, <laughs> which is awesome. Uh, I'm really impressed with the way the mentoring program is working, and, and thank you so much for giving those specific examples. Um, it kind of helped me see what day in the life 
could be like. So thank you. Okay, any other questions? I, just one more. I hate to. Um, so at St. Bernard's, we take on elementary schools. So we have Northside and Elm Lawn that we do snack packs. So on the weekends, they uh, have a, a, a pack that they bring home. And then yep. St. Luke's does um, Sock Trail. But that's elementary school. Could the service clubs be a buffer for you if the service clubs took on that middle school or the youth center to do a similar program? Yeah, um, we actually already worked with um, Middleton Community Church, provided snack bags for us all summer for our low-income kids, so that was great. And I actually just met with them last week because they're interested in continuing that throughout the school year as well. We're doing some research right now on like what foods make the most sense and like what the needs of the families are and what the kids want to eat, so that stuff's not getting wasted. But yeah, they're kind of taking us on as a program um, for the snack bags for the awesome. middle schoolers. So yeah, definitely. So Percy, you want to say something? I promise I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, to build on Gabrielle's answer um, around collaborating with a larger organization, uh, I would shy away from that. Uh, in my early years of working with youth, I worked for the Boys and Girls Club of Dane County. And because of the national programming, it's very restricted in terms of what you can do, right? And I think that what Rebecca and Gabrielle and the Middleton Rec Department have been building is very unique. They, they're very creative. They have ideas. And I think we have the right people with the right mindset to build something really special, right? I, I'm a firm believer in if you build it, they will come. And if you just look at the numbers over the last four years, it's going from 14 to over 50 or close to 60 with a waiting list. And that's encouraging to see kids actually wanting to be a part of an after school program. And I think often, sometimes we, because of the community, right? Because of Middleton and, and the perception around it being very affluent and our kids really not having needs, that need is there for a good number of our students across the district. And we do have kids that would rather be in our buildings after school rather than being at home. We have kids that when they go home, they don't have space to do homework. Um, and that's just an example, right? And I think what they're doing at, at Clark Street needs to be built on. Uh, they do need larger space. Uh, they have the right mindset, like I said before. Um, but I, I will say this to, to really advocate for the work that they're doing. Uh, if you don't know, today is January 15th, which is the 90th anniversary or 90th birthday for the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And one thing that he really was pushing uh, towards the end of his life, he was coming up with the Poor People's Campaign. And he was really charging the nation to really think about reallocating resources to programs for social uplift. And here we are with two phenomenal people that are running a, an amazing after school program that I see as a program of social uplift. And if we really want it to be sustainable and, and be solid, we have to provide the necessary resources in order for it to live. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Chief Folk, you know, we've been working together. Uh, even in the work that we've been doing internally in the district, I couldn't do it all alone by myself. It required resources. It required manpower. So the district has shifted resources in a way to better meet the needs of our most uh, disenfranchised and impoverished kids in the district. And we still have a ways to go, right? But with the collaboration with the Middleton Rec Center and the work that we're doing in Middleton, and we can strengthen our partnerships with the Common Council and our community-based organizations, we have everything that we need right here in Middleton. There are just some things that we need to shift, uh, but I'm encouraged that I know you all will, will take that into consideration because they are a huge benefit to the children in our district. I, I remember when Youth Center was struggling, we couldn't even have uh, six to seven students come. So it's great what's happening now. And Susan, you have a question? Percy, does this need to be expanded <coughs> to high school students? Absolutely. Now, there, there is after-school programming that takes place at the high school. They call it, um, Jesus, something after hour. But it's really focused on uh, academics. It's a study table. Uh, but with the folks that are doing that, before I left Memorial, one thing that Bruce Diamond, who was from Middleton, what he was able to do for Memorial High School is he, he built his after-school program, but he also provided like a really nice dinner every day. 
for those kids. He worked with food services and it wasn't just kind of like a sack lunch. They would have spaghetti with garlic bread and stuff like that. And those are things that um, <coughs> I think that we can make happen in Middleton uh, because they have a vision, um, but it will require some resources and, and they do have the support of the district. And one thing, because the work has been uh, taking off so well on the crimery side of things, uh, we had to have a conversation at the district level around being equitable because we weren't allocating the same dollars to the Glacier Creek side. So we had to ante up at least to level the playing field while at the same time we knew that we weren't giving enough to what they were doing. Um, so I know that when we go into budget discussions, we will have to look at our budget and see if we can uh, support even more than what we've been doing in the past few years because what they're doing is, is special and they do have kids that are waiting to be a part of the program and we'll be expanding the high school. So hopefully when that's built, uh, we will have enough sp uh, space to run, you know, a plethora of after school programs and, and really serving more and more kids because we do have the right people power to make that happen. We just need a few more dollars to really make it stick. Any questions for Percy? Let's give them a big hand. Great job, right, guys. Thank you. Okay, so the next presentation is from Greater Medicine Convention and Visitors Bureau Business Plan for 2019 and Partnership Benefits for Middleton. And just to clarify, I am not Diane Morgenthaler. <laughs> I'm Julie Peterman, the Tourism Director here. And it occurred to me while I was working on the agreement uh, that is on your agenda tonight for approval with the Greater Madison Convention and Visitors Bureau, that many of you might not be aware of all of the work that the GMCVB is doing and the benefits that this work has on Middleton. So I asked Diane if she could present tonight on some of the exciting things that are happening there in terms of organizational restructuring give us an overview of some of the projects and the initiatives that they have in the pipeline for 2019. And then lastly, do a deeper dive, and that was for you, Mike. Uh, do a deeper dive on what the benefits of this partnership are for tourism and the city of Middleton. So at this point, I'll step out of the way and turn the microphone over to Diane. Thank you, Julie, and thank you everyone for allowing me the opportunity to talk a little bit about what's uh, in the pipeline for our organization and how that impacts Middleton. Okay. So about two years ago, we set out to really take a look at how did we want to think about tourism in the future and what did we want our destination to be in the future. And we determined that our vision for Greater Madison was that it would be recognized as one of the world's most vibrant and innovative places to live, work, and visit. And that gave us really that sort of star to aim for. And as we were aiming for that, we said, okay, what kind of organization do we have to be in order to get there? And so our organization, which we have just as of January 2nd, uh, we've taken on a new name. We're calling, instead of Greater Madison Convention and Visitors Bureau, we are now doing business as Destination Madison. And we aspire to be an exceptional organization for stakeholder and community engagement that inspires a thriving visitor destination. And it's this stakeholder and visitor engagement that really is behind all of the work effort that we're putting forward over the next few years. So to talk just a little bit more about kind of what our overarching goals are, uh, it's really to honor our community and our visions for the destination and organization, those two things that, we've, that I've just shared with you, to meet or exceed some contract and internal organization goals that we have, and to continue evolving and implementing our new vision. And as part of that, one of the things that we determined was that we had a little bit of streamlining to do. So we had uh, undertook over the last year, brought a group of our board members together, um, to really look at what it was our organization structure and how could we become a really nimble organization in the future to take advantage of the best opportunities for visitors and events to come to this area. Our old organization, we had two entities, the Convention and Visitors Bureau and the Madison Area Sports Commission. They had separate governance boards. They had funding that was separate, but they also had funding that was linked. 
And so we had two different boards talking back and forth about what we should do and how we should invest. And we said, that's probably not the optimum investment strategy. So we wanted to look at optimizing the governance structure, make sure both of the, our, all of our programmatic work continued, both our sports work and our convention and leisure work, uh, increase the visibility of our organization, and create some flexibility and resiliency in what continues to be a really very competitive <coughs> market for tourism. Um, to put it in perspective, Dane County in 2017, these are the last numbers we have, tourism generated $1.25 billion in Dane County. Huge <coughs> numbers. So we want to be sure that we're able to compete with other cities uh, around the nation because we really represent all of Dane County regionally and nationally for business. So as we looked at that organization structure, we said, let's make, let's make this work. Uh, first of all, let's give ourselves a name people can say. So Destination Madison, our new name. Let's pull together our current volunteer leadership from our two boards and create a consolidated board. And we have done that. We have comprised that new board. And then let's make sure that we continue to have engagement and support for our sports activities. So Madison Area Sports Commission will be an advisory body to the programmatic work of our sports team, which is very, very critical. To put that in perspective, in 2018, we closed 141 events and, and uh, conferences, conventions, pieces of business. Of those confirmed events, four, 13 of them took place here in Middleton venues. Uh, of our room nights, uh, we also had 28 uh, events where we had hotels in Middleton participate, generating about 16,000, a little over 16,000 room nights in Middleton. So having our programmatic work remain strong is really critical to us, it's critical to Middleton too. So I want to talk just a little bit about the six sort of buckets of work that we are engaged in from a strategic perspective and how that relates to, to um, the work that we're doing and the partnership we have with Middleton. So kind of first up um, is a bucket we call our streets, neighborhoods, and regions. And that's really making sure we're representing the unique character and the story for all of our surrounding communities and neighborhoods. So it's engaging regionally. It's making res getting residents to engage and in 2019 we're launching what we're calling our regional collaboration council where we're going to pull together all of our uh, regional partners uh, Middleton, Verona, Fitchburg, Sun Prairie, Wanakee and others who want to come together to think about how we can um, look at how we're investing tourism funds to make that regional national presence and then how all of us can sort of lift our boats at the same time so we're helping each other promote our destinations. That's a really critical thing for the future as competition continues to be tough. A next item up is really destination development. And this is something we invested heavily in and the Middleton Tourism Commission also sponsored, which is developing immersive experiences. So many of you may know the Mustard Museum has uh, Mustard Bites tasting that has uh, been a really great success. We worked with an outside, brought in an outside consultant to help build those immersive experiences, to coach the businesses in building them, and provided the businesses with a marketing toolkit that included video and photography professionally done in order to ensure that what, we've, what we have branded, Essential Madison Experiences Certified Local, um, that brand will have resonance across our community and we can build upon that as we go into 2019. Destination training is another opportunity for us to help our frontline staff in our hotels, taxi drivers, or whoever's sort of the first line of uh, sight or line of contact with a visitor to be able to share with them what they can do when they're in town, regardless of what their um, experience level is or their, just get them comfortable telling our story for us. Event mix is another big thing. This is really about generating those sporting events, going and getting them, finding those conventions and conferences. We are adding a sales manager to our team this year. This will bring our sales staff to six full-time direct sales managers to work nationally to generate business. We're also uh, shifting one of our internal team to uh, be a business development professional, so really working to build our pipeline so that we can accelerate the pace at which we're bringing business into our communities. We want to continue to, to serve uh, our really existing events. We have CrossFit coming for another couple years. It's a huge event. Ironman, the WIAA Games. We have uh, 15 competitions for the state here. And we are preparing right now to support the uh, Veterans Golden Age Games in 2020. So we will be working all year 
on preparing for that event, which is a, a, an Olympic style event for 55 and plus uh, veterans. So we're very excited and working with the VA on that. Um, product development is another uh, key component of our work, advocating for the right structures in the right places at the right times to support that um, the industry. Let's get this out of here. Um, we're also going to be hosting uh, an updated sports product development workshop. We did this about four years ago, inviting all of our parks departments, uh, city staff, regional folks together to sort of learn from some experts about what sports trends are, um, how to manage sports facilities, and a variety of other things. We're, we're looking to do that uh, the beginning of May in 2019, <coughs> so more to come and invitations for that. Destination branding, our new name, uh, some campaigns that we have going on, and then continuing to build out how to build that right brand for the greater Madison area that's authentic and unique. And then our organization's uh, viability, kind of making sure we have our funding lined up. Uh, we have some contracts coming <coughs> up with Dane County that will be uh, <coughs> renewed next year. And really looking for more ways to develop private investment in what we do, because what we do, while it uh, benefits the visitors and the hospitality community, uh, it also supports all of our quality of life. The restaurants that we enjoy, the cultural activities that are available to us are all really supported by visitors. And the other piece that we're looking at is really having a strong community relations and advocacy plan so that when things come up and a visitor voice is needed at the table, we're ready to, uh, to support and address those uh, concerns. So Middleton. With Middleton, we have, in addition to our financial arrangement, we also have a, a series of ways that we engage with Middleton as a community and with the various uh, aspects of the Tourism Commission as we go through the year. And the first is really engagement. Um, because of the uh, investment that Middleton has made with our organizations in the past, we've had two representatives on the Sports Commission Board of Directors. Uh, one of those representatives, actually Julie Peterman, has been uh, uh, elected to serve on the new Destination Madison Board of Directors. Uh, Corey Mace uh, from the Tourism Commission will sit on the Madison Area Sports Commission Advisory Committee. Um, he has been on the Sports Commission Board. We also have representation on the Sports Product Development Committee uh, from Jim Strom from Marriott West. Um, and we also on our Community Relations Committee, which is sort of our current public advocacy committee and kind of keeping track of what's going on in the world. Um, we also have Cindy Foley from Marriott West sitting on that committee. And we welcome anyone who is interested to say, hey, I'm interested in participating in something that you have going on. Where can I be, where can I connect in with you? Um, this re regional collaboration council will probably start off as a marketing conversation and morph into whatever it needs to be, whatever the regional team members want to participate in. In addition, we have uh, sponsored education events that we do to help our business partners uh, do their job business and to connect better and to connect with each other. And as a partner of uh, our organization, um, your teams are invited to come to those things and your businesses are invited to participate as well. A second level of deliverable is sort of what we call our sales and partnership benefits. And this is where information about who's coming to town or who's thinking about coming to town um, those leads for new business get distributed out to the Middleton hotels as well as to the Tourism Commission so they have a line of sight, actually I should really say tourism staff, so that they have a line of sight to who, who might be a good prospect to be uh, and a good fit for Middleton. We also distribute any group tour or motor coach and service leads as well out to uh, Middleton hotels and we work very closely with North Central Group in particular to help um, support the, the group tour efforts that they are engaged in. We provide convention service assistance. Well, what does that mean? Um, we feel like we're sometimes a concierge for how to find the things a, uh, a group might need when they're here. So we've done everything from source 5,000 tiny American flags to connecting people with speakers from the university to attend and participate in their events, uh, helping find uh, transportation or a, a place for a small board meeting if the, if the hotel can't provide that. We do that whether or not we're the person trying to bring that piece of business here. So any of our hotel partners can call on us, any of the Middleton team can call on us at any time and say, do you know somebody who can do this? Can you help me find somebody who could execute, could connect this and, and serve that, that um, visitor? Um, 
We also have some newsletters that go out on a regular basis. Every Monday, we send out what we call our coffee break. It talks about who's in town, but also who's coming in the next few weeks. And that helps our restaurants, our, our hotel staff, have a sense of who might be in town and do I have enough <coughs> staff on board if I've got somebody coming to town. And we do a lot more preparation. We have somebody like CrossFit or Ironman coming into town. We really make a, lar a longer lead time because those groups are so large. And we also have some materials that we produce, a visitor's guide as well as a visitor's map that prevent, pr provide some advertising opportunities to get out in our distribution uh, arenas there. We do distribute about 200,000 visitor's guides a year. We print two a year. Um, and they're very, um, they, people continue to like them even though we also have a very robust website that we want to, we link events to and we link back and forth between our two uh, websites for our two entities. See, these marketing benefits are really another piece of the work. I talked to pr about promoting the essential Madison experiences. We also distribute and display Middleton materials both at our offices as well as at Dane County Regional Airport where we, we staff the information uh, booth um, at, Middle, at Dane County Regional Airport. We also um, help promote Middleton events, uh, have Middleton visitor guides listing, and then again, content. We do a, a partner e-newsletter, we do a visitor e-newsletter. We're always looking for a story, and we try to highlight those things that are really likely to be of great interest to visitors making decisions to come here. And the last but not least is we have a, a public relations staff that are very well connected in, in our uh, local media as well as national media and we do uh, provide public relations support in two ways. One is we will help distribute a, a PR message from the team here. Um, second is when we're out and about we are promoting the greater Madison as a destination and we talk about all that it has to offer. Our PR team is actually going to the International uh, Travel Media Conference in New York City in two weeks. They have 50 appointments set up with travel writers and travel bloggers. So, um, you know, we're really excited about that opportunity to, to, to build that network and get the word out. So, we've got a lot on our plates and we're really excited about it. Um, I am more than happy to, to speak to anyone at any time about what we do. I'm very passionate about it and very excited about the things that we have on the horizon. I wanna thank all of you for your support over these many years. It's been great to work with the city. It's been great to work with the Tourism Commission. Um, we're really delighted about that and we're really, ex really excited to have continued engagement on the part of the team here with the work that we do going forward. So again, thank you for your support. Any quick questions about Diane? <coughs> okay, thank you, Diane. Thank you. And thank you, Julie. Okay, now we move on to The other part, which is approval of the consent agenda. Move approval. Second. Okay. So, motion is to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So the motion passes. And this is a big consent agenda. Can I, I know where, I didn't have a chance to comment, but on item number nine, which is the proposal to revise donated leave policy. Just a couple things I would ask be added to wording, and maybe that's already been taken care of, I don't know. I, probably not. Um, on page 62, 63 of the packet, and now I have it right here. Um, I would just recommend Middle of the page on page 62, it says hours to be contributed, accrued sick. I think it should be accrued sick leave. And uh, same thing on page 63 under the finance department text, it says there's two places where I would suggest that the word sick be replaced with the words sick leave. Actually, it's three places. It's a uh, first line underneath the two check boxes is a second sentence, and then the right above the place where somebody would sign their name, accrued sick, to change it to accrued sick leave. That'd be my recommendation. Okay, I'm sure that uh, I can see Bill and Mike are already doing that, so. Awesome. Okay, thank you, Robert. Thank you, appreciate it. <clears throat> now we are on to the agreements. 
तो यहाँ हमारे पास बहुत ही ओके वी एंड टू दी एग्रीमेंट्स एंड दैट्स दी दी फर्स्ट वन इज दी एग्रीमेंट बिटवीन दी सिटी ऑफ मिल्टन एंड वीर बर्कर फॉर डिजाइन इंजीनियरिंग सर्विसेज फॉर डाना ड्राइव सेडिमेंटेशन पॉन्ड रिपेयर ऑफ दर्ड डैमेज any questions or comments uh i guess i would just i was here but i just for the record um there was a question of where the recommended funding would come from mm -hmm. stormwater utility stormwater utility okay so stormwater utility not tid district number 5 nope. okay thank you Any other questions or comments? All those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So the motion passes unanimously. So the next one is uh, annual monitoring agreement with Capital Area Regional Planning Commission. Approval is recommended by the Finance Committee. Second. Any questions or comments? It's just a routine thing we do every year. So. All those in favor of this motion say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So the motion passes unanimously. Item number three: agreement with Greater Madison Convention and Visitors Bureau. We just heard their presentation. Move approval. Second. Second. Any questions or comments? Only the my only question is: Will the name need to be changing from yep. this long acronym? Your destination, medicine. That is the acronym still acceptable, or does the does the? Uh, I assumed when I worked on the agreement that that's a brand name, but that the entity is still called the Greater Madison Convention and Visitors. Okay, Center. wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? All those in favor of this motion to approve the agreement with Greater Madison Convention and Visitors Bureau say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So the motion passes unanimously. Number four, indemnification agreement between the city of Middleton and Red Tail Acres. Motion to approve the indemnification agreement is written. Okay. Need a second. Second. Any questions or comments? Uh, I know when we talked about this in public works, there was still some work that the uh, city attorney had to do. Um, not on this part of it. Not on this one? Okay. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, all those in favor of this uh, indemnic indemnification agreement between the city of Milton and Red Tail Acres say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So the motion passes unanimously. So the next is item number five. This is the Red Tail Acre Subdivision. This is the City Developer Agreement. I'll move approval as recommended by Public Works, and I believe that did include the City Attorney Review. Yeah. Okay, need a second? Second. Any questions or comments? I, I guess I would like, I saw the same thing in here on page 120 of the packet, the irrevocable letter of credit. Uh, there was a note that said that this, for, this, in its current form, is not satisfactory to the city attorney. Uh, can somebody <coughs> give me a little bit of background, and are we getting to the place where it would be in a form satisfactory? Very briefly, um, this is not the developer's fault. Fair enough. This, is, this is an issue where the bank furnishing security has previously been willing to, this, this same bank, to furnish um, letters of credit using the form that has been developed by the city over many years and it has now decided not to use our form anymore <laughs> and has inserted language that is unacceptable to me and to many other city attorneys around the state of Wisconsin. Okay. Um, we were talking briefly before the meeting that there are some options. I mean, what we want is the security. We don't necessarily care what the form of security is as long as it's legally enforceable. So at the moment, we're at impasse on that 
letter of credit, but that doesn't necessarily mean this project is dead in the water. That's, uh, thank you for that uh, background. I guess my next question is, can we approve this today if, if no. documentation inside, okay. Well, that's why it is the approval by Public Works was uh, there were contingencies including satisfaction by me and the current form is not satisfactory. Howard? Oh, I oh. Okay. So you said there are some options. So what are the other options? Well, I, again, I, 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 I only mentioned that there, there have been a number of security devices used over the years. Frankly, until this issue arose that is the problem here, most communities preferred to use a letter of credit because it was simpler, it was easier to work with the issuer, the, the money was easier to get at, but um, if, the, if the letter of credit stops being the vehicle of choice, we could possibly, although I would greatly prefer a, a good letter of credit, we could go with a bond of some kind. Um, I've known cases where, and most developers don't like to hear this, but they, they would prefer not to pay someone else to write the security and they just deposit a check, which they get back if everything is fine. Those are all satisfactory to me. And so this is still in the process of being worked out. Okay. So Larry, you this not to approve of this or could we approve of this contingent upon you resolving this issue? That's exactly what the public works motion was and I'm perfectly fine with that. You're okay with that? Yeah. Okay, with all those comments, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So the motion passes unanimously. So the next one is the encroachment agreement. That's the monuments monument sign and low voltage conductor in storm sewer and sanitary sewer easement. This is a Goodwill 6280 Century Avenue. They're opening up soon next month. Approve approval is recommended by both Public Works and the Finance. Second. Second. Okay, any questions or comments? Okay, all those in favor of the motion to approve the encroachment agreement with the uh, Goodwill industry say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So the motion passes unanimously. Item number seven, <clears throat> agreement between the city of Middleton and firefighters local 311 for a period January 1st, 2019 to December 31st, 2022. I'll move approval as recommended by personnel and finance. Second. Any questions or comments? Yes, Robert. Uh, just so that everyone is aware, I did, after personnel and finance met, uh, I did work with city staff to make a few corrections to the, the text. Um, if anybody wants me to go through those, I can tell you now, but they were call them typos more than anything else. They could be substantial issues if somebody got lost in the in reading <clears> the document, but there was nothing really substantial about the, the changes. Thank you, I saw that you were doing that with Mike, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, all those in favor of uh, approving the agreement between the city and the firefighters local 311 say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So the motion passes unanimously. We are now on to the resolutions. Resolution 2019-01, authorizing holding a referendum on April 2nd, 2019, relating to a proposed increase in the Milton Stormwater Utility Fee. Move approval. Second. Okay, questions and comments? Yes, so, Howard. Do we have any idea what it's gonna cost the city to design the <laughs> so, typing it up is all it's going to cost us? Yeah, we have 
paying for the ballots anyway. No additional cost. Appreciable addition. That's why the 10 years fee was important because to get it on the ballot, it's got to get through tonight. That's important to know. Are there other questions? Yes, Robert. No, actually. Joanna. I, Joanna I just wanted first. to say, because I think we heard some public testimony about not wanting to raise the fee, but this doesn't obligate the council raising the fee. This is no. allowing the council to say to the voters, you have the choice of whether you want to raise the fee or not, because um, we don't have the ability to raise a fee on our own. Um, so I think there's maybe some misinformation of to the public that this is actually just putting it on the ballot. Yes, that is correct. And just just <clears throat> for, for what it's worth, this isn't the council letting the people decide on its own. This is required by the state levy limits law that it cannot take effect unless approved by a referendum of the voters. Well, I, yes, Robert. Oh, uh, my, uh, my only question is, do we have, we have to make a sales pitch to the people of Middleton to vote one way or another in this referendum if, if <clears throat> this is the direction we go. Um, I see a lot of good information in my packet here that tells me generally the value of stormwater utility. Do we have anything specific to our request in this next referendum? I can ask you that. The information in the packet, what we sent out when we established the stormwater utility. When we did that, we also, Friends of Pheasant Branch, did a major publicity campaign for us. That was initiated after we approved going to referendum. I can envision. Uh, I don't think they're going to be willing to spend six to seven thousand on sending out individual mailers to each address in the city. But I certainly could see the city sending out a letter. And I would suggest that that maybe could come out of stormwater utility fees for that mailing since we can't send it out with a utility bill because the first utility bill comes out after the election. So that is a problem. We're a little bit in a tight time frame. Um, so that's one thing that we can do. Uh, so you've got examples of what was put together in terms of information. And certainly this would be different for the increase because we're proposing the funds be used for stormwater repair not maintenance of existing facilities. So this is looking at damage that was done, which FEMA will cover some of. FEMA will not cover damage where the facility wasn't previously engineered. So one of the big concerns is FEMA probably will not cover any repair of the bank just east of Park Street the really big visible problem. Uh, it probably would not cover doing anything for Stricker and Tiedemann Ponds. And we're not talking about trail repair, boardwalk repair, or anything. This is stormwater. Mm -hmm. So if we wanted to get an additional pump for Stricker Pond, or Tiedemann rather, it would have to come out of city finances. Uh, and there's, you've got a list in your packet of what adds up to $2.3 million estimated of some projects. There could be others when we finish this study looking at it. These are rough estimates. We bring in 280000 at the moment for stormwater, and that's for maintenance. Uh, which is over five years comes to 1.4 million, which would mean if we, would, doesn't even cover all the projects. But it also means we wouldn't be doing our normal maintenance. And most of our normal maintenance is geared towards water quality. You know, removing phosphorus, removing sediment, those sorts of things. 
Um, okay. Now we do have the option for getting, or hopefully we will get some FEMA money. We have to pay for it up front. Fares would get reimbursed. So that's a problem. Uh, I asked Bill to look into the cost, and he gave us somewhere here and all of this. I have it. <laughs> Simply the interest cost for borrowing the money to do this. And I don't know, does FEMA reimburse interest cost? Well, uh, we could borrow from TIF. Borrowing is not an issue there at all. So uh, it carries interest. It well, still carries no, interest. We don't charge right now. So oh, yes, we do. Oh, yeah. Yes. Well, maybe and the interfund borrowing, we always charge interest, and it right. is higher than the rate the money would earn sitting in a bank. So and it's real interest. Borrowing money from TIF also limits what we can do with our TIF funds. And Tread carefully. <coughs> yes. A lot of the damage was done in the five area. And Stricker and Tito and Ponds are not in the TIF district. So you couldn't borrow from TIF for those. It's a problem. Um, current interest rate on a 10 year tax exempt debt is around 3%. So if we borrowed 560000 we would be paying 16800 for annual interest. This is where the stormwater utility has an advantage, getting money up front. The other thing is the money that comes in is dedicated to stormwater only. So we can't siphon it off like a suggestion getting TIF money use it can't use stormwater for anything other than stormwater other than stormwater yeah. that was that's a big selling point for this um, so I as far as I see it this is a good idea um, oh the other one that I wanted to mention that was really important for citizens it's when we established the stormwater utility, we set for each individual homeowner the allocated one equivalent runoff unit, regardless of the size of their impervious surface. That saves the city a tremendous amount of money in not having to continually update GIS mapping to calculate. So for example, I have a rain garden. That would, in Madison, that could be calculated as a credit, and it costs money to do that. So I'm more than willing to pay the current $15 a year to save the city money just so I don't have to pay $3 less or something. Uh, it also shifts the majority of the costs that we raise to the bigger impervious surfaces. So businesses and so on instead of when it's the money is collected through taxes residential customers will be paying or residents will be paying a majority of the funds if it in the stormwater utility it becomes a lot of businesses or predominantly the businesses it also collects money from churches nonprofits and the city and the school district. So it's, I personally <coughs> see it as a little more fair way of doing it than through property taxes. Um, other questions? No, I think, I think you answered my questions and, and I, 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 um, I agree that uh, a fair way to do this is to send this out for referendum to the people of Middleton can decide whether this is important to them. If, but I will say that if we, w we will need to do, there will need to be a, a concerted education portion yes. to this between now and April 3rd. Second. Second. Thank this you. This is something I will say, I personally worked on a lot of the education for the previous one mm -hmm. and with the Friends of Pheasant Branch. 
I am more than willing to do the same thing again. I don't want to spend my time working on it before we approve the resolution. Fair enough. I think, you know, this is unpaid volunteer time for the city. Absolutely. Your next is I will also be contacting the Friends of Pheasant Branch and <coughs> the Clean Lakes Alliance. They both, as I said, supported us previously. Clean Lakes Alliance got head spots for us even. And if they do nothing more than send out notices to various members by email even, I think it would be a big help. Great. So it does answer Howard's question. It will cost money sending all those pamphlets and things. So, so I don't know how much. Emily. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if any um, <coughs> city council members here have heard anything other doors or from neighbors about the cost. I, I have heard a little chatter of why isn't it just 30? Why did you pick 45? And I know philosophically why because well the math tells us but I, I'm wondering is has anybody been hearing anything or is just people like yeah stuff happened and and they they think it's valid anybody you've heard nothing well it just nothing. from what I, you remember from the last meeting that uh, I don't know there was a how it came up to triple that fee but uh, Joanna came up with the five years, and uh, I guess it's, uh, I, I probably will go through these details that uh, we really don't know that uh, what our five-year plan would be, and uh, our, we are paying that consultant, and we just extended or would be extending his contract up to February for him, for Car Cardinal to come up with a, they are doing all the, Yes, let me finish. I gave you the time, so I, you will have time again. So the Cardinal will come up with a five-year plan and will also come up with the what it will cost. And uh, I have some questions about the cost, which is handed over here. And I will ask, ask Sean here. Sean, not, there was a, I gave you two questions here. One is that about the Donna Drive sedimentation pond. When I look at uh, the cost which was given, given by the city for FEMA it was more like uh, 830k and here I see 700 and I looked at your details in your case gave the details that how much sand will be put how many you know every item was detailed and in this case it is just uh, one line <coughs> no details so so in in your case you did or the staff which put that together you looked into what what it will cost right I, uh, are you referencing the numbers that we had included in our uh, in preliminary damage assessment for the FEMA submittal? Yes. Yeah, those were very, very rough ballpark guesstimates put together on extremely short notice from people that had had very little sleep. I don't trust them uh, to a large degree. We have on the agenda tonight actually design of the re rehabilitation of the Donna Drive Pond. Following that design, I think we'll have a solid cost estimate for the reconstruction. So you're feeling I, right now you couldn't tell whether it will be 130 or 700. I, I think that if that placeholder turns out to be in the right scale, I'll be happy. Okay. So you would and be the happy with second the one is, excuse me, the second one is uh, the stream bank, stream bank sl slope down the Park Street. You are already somewhere along the way. That design that your has Your cost estimate is 166, and uh, here it's 500. That, that design work now has begun. There are a couple of ways that that's being looked at, sort of a hard armoring solution and more of a soft uh, engineered tow bank stabilization. Uh, I do not think that one or the other of those solutions has been chosen, so so that's going to really drive the design and the project cost. We don't really know right now, and when do you think we will know that? Well, I, I think after that first decision gets made, probably within a month or month and a half, we should have a pretty good cost estimate. Okay, so Robert, you had something to say? so. Um, if I did, I forgot what it was. So there's a, we have already submitted a grant for the, these four parts there from Wisconsin DNR. 
Right. Who, okay. So it's, and we uh, just heard today, in fact, that we've been awarded in varying amounts each of those four. Okay. So we were supposed right. to get about 50%. Yeah. So, so we will know that. So, okay. So I'm going to go through, unless you have some quick comments, I'm going to go through my comments. So, okay. Thank you, go Sean. Ahead. Okay. So I think one thing is that uh, we all agree that the floods were devastating. They were very <coughs> damaging to our, especially the, the Creek Corridor, and, uh, and I guess uh, there were still some issues with the Tiedemont Pond as well, but not quite as much. I mean, that's a very small amount there. With Stricker Pond, this was more usual, and uh, there's a still flooding in the Graver Pond. So, so I think we agree they were very devastating, and we want to fix our conservancy. We agree there as well. And uh, the issue here is that uh, are we really ready for what we are trying to do here? So, um, I mean, should we have this referendum now, or should we have it? Uh, I can see the pros of doing it now is that uh, the flood damage is fresh on people's mind, and we can, uh, you know, show they are more likely to vote for it. But I don't think that's a very good reason for doing this. We should be doing it because we want to fix something. Not to, I'm sure that uh, people will rem remember the floods even if we were to do this re referendum in 2020. So, so right now we don't really know what needs repairing and at what cost. Our consultant, Cardinal, will submit the report in early February now, although they were supposed to submit in December. Estimating for pairing two high priority projects, Don and Dry Pond and uh, Park Street Slope, uh, they would be coming, like Sean said, in about maybe a couple of months uh, at the most. So the cost estimate just to look at uh, Don and Dry Pond vary from, you know, Sean said it was more approximate from 130 to 700. And the same way for uh, repairing the Park Street, submitted to FEMA is 166, and uh, one line estimate from uh, Cardinal is uh, 500,000. So, so what it really shows is that we are just, uh, we don't have the cost estimate, and they will be coming in the next couple of months. So, so I think before going to referendum, we need to know what needs to be repaired and what the cost is. And also, the FEMA is coming here on 22nd. We will know more or less that uh, at least we'll have preliminary estimate that what FEMA is going to pay for it. And FEMA pays and what 75 percent, and then state pays 12.5 percent, and we end up with 87.5 percent, and the city pays the rest of it. So once we know how much uh, is going to be paid by FEMA, we will be in a much better shape. And we already heard from Wisconsin DNR, we submitted the grant for one little over a million dollars. So we were supposed to get half of that, but I don't know what we got, but at least we will have something from there. So, um, so we need to know how much money we have and uh, how much our expenditure are, then, then we can really make a plan here and, uh, you know, that whether to raise that utility rate by, you know, triple it or maybe even have more or whether to have it for four years or five years of what durations. So I think it probably would be much better to hold this referendum in April 2020 if we need it. And the reason being is that we will have a data by that time on our expenses, and uh, a lot of it will be, and um, our consultants will have those numbers as well. We will know how much FEMA is going to pay and what are the other sources of it. So I know we have funds sitting from stormwater utility, which, uh, you know, Bill has uh, given those numbers. And, uh, but what we, what we don't know is the FEMA funds. And then I know that uh, in the past, we used TIF funds, and in this case, I was just talking to Larry here, especially for pond, if we could show but for test here, we could pay from this, and uh, there are developments coming along the parameter, which will, if we didn't have that pond ready, they will not happen. 
So, and uh, yeah, there are other, um, you know, sources of money too. So, but I think, I don't think we are ready at this stage. And once we have all the data together, which probably will be next year, and we could go, there's nothing to lose uh, waiting for that. Yes, Susan. Okay, I disagree with you. That's okay. Uh, we, can one of the things we can agree to disagree, so. One of the important things is we need to get these facilities repaired as soon as possible. We are at risk for additional damage. And climate is changing. We now get, and one of the big concerns among the people working on stormwater throughout the county are winter rains. Had last week a one inch winter rain. In the winter, that's equivalent to a one inch rain on a parking lot over the entire city and area. There is no pervious surface when the ground is frozen. It is equivalent to impervious surface. Forget, and in addition, what could happen in the summer. We need to get repairs done. Down at the Pride Pond is a big one. That bank at Park Street is incredibly important. Because if we get another rain <coughs> coming through, that will, and it doesn't need to be the 13 inch rain, that will undercut that bank even more. Which, right now, I think it's about 100 feet from private property, but we don't want it increasing. So that's one of the things. But one of the bigger things is if we wait till 2020 to go to referendum, that means we won't start really collecting money to have enough to do anything until 2021 or 2022. That's putting it off a long ways. So any repairs that we do before then, we're going to have to borrow money. And it's either take it from TIF or their road budget and pay interest on it. Or, you know, once we have that $2.6 million, just use part of it. What $2.6 million? From that Clark Street properties. This is, those proposals are really sort of iffy and up in the air. <coughs> um, I think, frankly, the citizens deserve the chance to make a decision on this. And we've had a tremendous <coughs> response in terms of fu donating on their own funds for repair. We've had, you know, the Friends of Pheasant Branch have been raising money. Mike McDowell has been raising money. The city has been taking money. I know I personally have given more than I will pay for the two, the five years of this utility because I believe in it. I have friends that have used their, the donations they make at the end of the year, which is quite a bit, I have a feeling, that has gone directly to the city for stormwater repair. Um, I certainly could see negotiating how much we raise it or for how long, but I think we have got to do something now. It's the most cost-effective way of doing it and responsible way. The next one is Howard. I thought I was the only one who did that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a nice ringtones like you do. No, which, one, <laughs> which one do you want to hear? I got every animal on the planet. <laughs> it was a storm alert. It's a storm alert, though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a storm alert, by the way. In difference to the fact that most of us have been sitting here since 5.30 this evening, um, if we could expedite this issue and the rest of the agenda, I would appreciate it. So in my personal opinion is I don't think it – it lends a lot of discussion content to the talking about um, designing how many plants come out of Tiedemann's Pond tonight for this issue. This issue is far greater and far bigger than that, and it simply is a question. Do we put a question in front of the populace of the city of Middleton? That's all it is. Um, we can debate how much that is, and we can debate when and everything like that, but I think all of us 
gathered around this table at one time or another, and having spoken to most of us, <coughs> would agree that a $15 stormwater fee is pretty low and probably needs to be raised. So this gives us an opportunity to throw that out to the public, and if they go thumbs up, we're in good shape. If they go thumbs down, we got a problem. So um, if we could just kind of move this on and, and not plow this ground over 10 times. Okay, so I, will, uh, I got a few comments and then you. I think uh, what's really important here is, which we are not even addressing, the single most important challenge for us to address, that even if we had that kind of a rain, that we don't have the floods. That means working with Madison, if you were to look at that from where our storm water comes from, big part of is coming from um, Madison and Springfield, and I didn't even realize the storm water from Menards and from the West Town Mall, all of that is coming here to the south side, to Middleton. So, so working with others so that uh, the water stays where it is and that by itself, that uh, y you know, we won't have the damaging effect which we have. Otherwise, if we don't do that and we repair these, we are at square one again. You can keep on spending money and go through the <coughs> process. So, so I think uh, that actually is, uh, should be a higher priority. Well, Susan, you have spoken, Mike, and then Susan. Uh, just kind of on the cost, you know, when we submitted the FEMA application, it was less than one month after major rain, and we still had facilities underwater at that time. So it's very hard, very difficult to get uh, estimates. So most of it was uh, uh, scientific, scientific guesses on staff's part. Guesses. And now we're getting to the point where we're getting real estimates from engineering companies. So there is going to be a variation in cost from the FEMA application to what we see coming forward. We knew that all along. We talked about it too. I just want to make sure you knew that. And as far as the FEMA meeting next Tuesday, I don't know that we'll expect to have actual dollar amounts, but we will be working with uh, a person from FEMA to try to get to that point, hopefully within the next few weeks, so that we have an understanding from FEMA. But at best, uh, from the discussions they've had with staff, we're looking at um, uh, support for areas that were, were already engineered in the creek corridor not the areas that were not engineered. And uh, about half of the creek corridor, I'm, I'm just speaking roughly here, uh, was not engineered. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, those cost estimates, you know, it was in the neighborhood of $5 million for the creek corridor, about two and a half million, if that estimate is accurate, uh, were part of the engineered portion of the creek corridor. So for that, we might have an expectation of FEMA support. For the non-engineer parts, we don't. So there is a gap in funding without um, some kind of uh, additional source like that we could get from someone. So, and I would hope for those who are, are watching at home, you, you know, we, we talked about what the referendum question actually said. It gives the, the voters a choice to raise the ERAP unit charge to fifteen dollars to forty five, and uh, it explains what a yes answer means. On that. We'll get this information out if the council approves the question. We'll get it out soon. Uh, but the estimates are going to be a little slower in coming until we get. I mean, beyond just the, the scientific guesses. Um, the engineer's estimates are going to be harder to come by. Susan. Okay. Something else that I think everybody's <coughs> forgetting about. We have a couple hundred thousand oh, water okay, utility sorry. at the moment for projects that we have been planning. That won't even begin to cover flood damage. So if we use stormwater money, for flood damage, we're going to have to forego those other projects. 
that's something else we need to be thinking about because we won't have the money for them or find an additional source. And I don't think we can use TIF for all of those. And so that's one of the things. Uh, the other one is simply the length of time again of how long it will be before we have adequate money to do this. Oh, in terms of Gurdip talking about, and I completely agree, Middleton's in a very unfortunate location where we have the north and south branches of Pheasant Branch Creek, the south branch starting about Menards, that big detention pond at Mineral Point in the Beltline, it drains into Middleton and a significant portion of the county going towards the northwest drains into Middleton. Solving those issues is going to take a long time. It's got to be countywide, got to get through the county board. I'm on the Lakes and Watershed Commission. We're looking into it. They're doing studies, trying. The first one is simply getting the lake levels down to at least the mandated level. Uh, and that's a problem because the DNR regulates that. Um, this year to drain the lake after the flood, it meant violating DNR regulations in terms of having to cut protected endangered plant species all up and down the river to get so the water will go quickly down the river. Uh, I've heard estimates of when other municipalities have tried to get levels lowered by the DNR, it's taken several years. This is going to take years to get the bigger problem solved. So I think we should not drag our feet. Thank you. I got a I'll question for our, our city attorney. Um, what's the procedure that you have to go through to call a question? Well, Dan still needs yeah, he, to he speak. Hasn't he hasn't spoken. had a chance. Dan, go ahead. Thank you. And then maybe at least okay. give, give everybody a chance. When you talk so. to anybody who lives in Middleton and you ask them, why did you move to Middleton? What do they usually say? They usually say the schools. They usually say our public lands, our conservancy. How many <coughs> times have we heard that? All of us. Every single time when we put out our surveys, that's what people talk about. So there's really no fairer way to, to do this than to go to referendum. Ask the people what's important to you. Um, I think that Joanna's idea of uh, totally agree with sunsetting is the way to go so that it, uh, folks know that it's for a short period of time. I also agree with Robert that I think the one thing that we've la lacked is, is not the reasoning why we have to do it. I think before it happens, there's gonna have to be um, some more education. When somebody asks you for money, generally speaking, you ask why. So I think we need to do a better job somehow between now and the referendum of letting people know what we're gonna spend it on, what FEMA isn't covering, so that people understand that we can't get this from FEMA. As, as we found during the cub, uh, public comments at the beginning of, of the, this meeting, there's some folks that don't understand. In order to be successful in our referendum, we're gonna wanna be able to answer some of those questions. I support taking it to the people. I support taking it to the voters. They should decide this. They should decide if it's important to them. But I think that uh, we as a city, city staff, however we do that, I think that we're gonna to need to do a little bit better job of pinpointing what we are gonna get reimbursement for, what we're not gonna get reimbursement for, so people have an understanding. This discussion, although informative, we got, and I agree with Howard, we got stuck in the weeds. What we're really asking here is, do we think that we should ask people of Middleton whether they support a raise in a segregated fund, it can't be used for anything else, yeah. to fix the damage we have. 
that's my comments. Any other, Kathy? You have anybody else? Okay, the, the motion is to authorize holding a referendum on April 2nd, 2019. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So the motion passes. So the next item is 2019-02, uh, adopting risk dot equipment rates. Full approvals recommended by the Finance Committee. Second. Okay. Any questions or comments? One question. Yes, Robert. Um, the third whereas. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I can add humor to some people's lives. Um, it says uh, that the state of Wisconsin Department of Transportation has changed from annual updating of its equipment rates to a more frequent updating. If you go to the next paragraph, it talks about um, Wisconsin, state of Wisconsin Department of Transportation <coughs> classified equipment rates and non-standard equipment rates, which change annually. Is that Correct. It seems like both those statements may be uh, diametrically opposed, but uh, maybe they're talking about two different things. I don't know. Feels like one of the two statements should be struck when it set. One says this happens more often than once a year, and the other one says it happens annually. And I just wanted to ask. Yeah. I they used to be calendar driven and they're not anymore. So I can't even promise that they are updated at least annually, but sometimes they're updated more often than once a year. Not on any particular schedule, not on any particular date. You go look at their website and see what the current version is. It's that random. So given that information, and thank you, Sean, I guess I would make a quick recommendation that we just strike the three words and whatever commas need to be struck in as well, stricken, uh, which change annually. I don't think those three words add anything to this document. Well, that, it, it does have that following clause or other amendments there too, and I think that was intended to address this sort of scattershot timing of updates. Um, that's not how I read it, but that that's a I, fair reading. I think that's what was intended, and I, there may be a more elegant way to say that. I don't know. Who's the author of the um, resolution? I, I think Larry helped me with this one. <coughs> Three years ago. Yeah. <laughs> now we know who the author is. Okay, so are you okay, Robert, or you want to change those three words? I probably got the decimal in there. I guess I'll live with it one way or another, so if people want to just leave it the way it is. Okay, any other comments? Okay, all those in favor of this motion adopting the equipment rates say aye. Aye. Everyone opposed, so the motion passes unanimously. And resolution item number 3, 2019-03, to accept the report concerning adverse impact of the Pleasant View Golf Course from future improvement to Pleasant View Road. Four approvals recommended by the Finance Committee. Second. And, and just recognizing and that the version adopted by the Finance Committee is right. different from yes. the version in everybody's this one here. original packet. It has Larry's footprints all over. Yeah, yes. once corrected by Larry, so. I have a, I have a question. Um, did we get a second? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we have a okay, second. Yeah. I, have, I have a quick question. Have we decided, is, I don't recall voting on, is there going to be a stoplight there or a roundabout? There is going to be a roundabout? Last, uh, the last meeting of the public works people were, I would say, relatively insistent on the fact that there's roundabouts there. And this, and in, in this adverse report is based on? Both. Both. Okay. Uh, All right. It will be. So it won't change. The roundabout it. actually had less of an impact, I think. They moved, the stuff. Yeah. they moved the roundabouts and moved the road just a hair, okay. and it was fine. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. I'd just like to say, Larry, thank you for this update. It changes <coughs> a lot about how I feel about this. <laughs> so. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay, all those in favor of the motion as updated version of uh, the back page of 
this uh, mm, this resolution by Larry say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So the motion passes. <coughs> 2019-04, establishing salaries of non-represented employees. Over approval is recommended by finance. Second. Se Any questions or comments? Okay, all those in favor of uh, approving 2019-04, establishing the 2019 salaries for non-represented employees, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So the motion passes. So the next one is uh, CSM Platt. Final plat, Red Tail Acres Subdivision, 4821 County Q. Move approval. Need a second? Second. Any questions? Larry, yeah, you want to the, say something? If you've got your city uh, administrator's notes, the form of the motion that, that Mike developed is perfect. And I would prefer That's that the motion be in that form. Whatever Mike says. Because right it's there. not, it's a deferred effective date approval. It's right there. As opposed there. to simply approval. Right. It's also approved the same. It was the conditions that have right. been identified by other committees. And all My that motion that is what stuff. Mike has yep. got here. Yeah, okay. have all the committees approved this way. I, I have to give credit to Sean for that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I leave her with that. I think Larry did. <laughs> Okay, you all did a great job. So, <laughs> great. any other questions or comments? Otherwise, all those in favor of this motion say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So the motion passes unanimously. Easements. This is the item number one: underground electric gas main easement for stagecoach trail apartments and future trailhead. Move approval. Second. Is this urgent that it be done immediately because we are normally doing? Um, granting and accepting easements by resolution, and I didn't know this was on the agenda until today, and I didn't have time to prepare a resolution, which I would do for the next council meeting. It, it, it's, it's much better if we do it that way. I, is that I apologize. I, I put this on the agenda, and I should have included a resolution. I'm looking at Danny Afable and J.T. Klein to see, can this wait two weeks? We do it for live, and then or concept or something? <clears throat> How fast can you write a resolution? Well, I mean, it's just the only part that's difficult is it's we have to notice it though. But you can't do anything in winter, right? Can we put this on the January 29th special meeting that we're having? Yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a good idea. Let's yeah. put it on the January 29th meeting. Yeah, Will that easy. work? Okay. Okay, we skip this one. Oh, okay. we defer. Do we need a motion? Yeah. Second. Okay, we need a motion to defer. Second. Okay, all those in favor of this motion to defer say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So the motion passes. Miscellaneous. City participation options for solar project at Middleton Municipal Airport. I'll move approval as recommended by finance, which is the 500 kilowatt. Second. Any questions or comments? Okay, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So the motion passes unanimously. Approval, item number two, approval in concept of city taking state plan review in-house. So this is, Bill, you want to say anything? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Okay, go ahead and say a few words. You've waited a long time. So I can actually say that this is really a good thing because I have gone to, wherever I went to meetings for the builders, they were always asking, why isn't Milton doing this in-house? So Bill is making that happen. Right, we've, we've done the preliminary study and we didn't want to pursue it any further until we had uh, conceptual agreement that we should continue. Um, it involves an agreement with the state, a uh, memorandum of un understanding that we would hire the, the people that the state declares has to be hired to do the plan review. It would also include some city staff time. Um, 
we would take on some training duties. We do minimal projects right now, plan review in house. So we've got a minimal amount that we do, uh, but this would take us to the next level, uh, dealing with engineering and architecture that is beyond the scope of normal building inspection duties. Uh, we feel we have the staff to do it, and we've got uh, commitments from people uh, for limited time employee or part-time employee, as you will, um, that would meet the requirements of the state uh, mandate of the architecture or engineering degree uh, that the staff currently does not have. So um, it's just the request to see if we should move forward. We'll make the contact with the state. We'll ensure and bring back more details and finalize things in, in the weeks to come if, if the council so desires. Good. Bill, this would prevent Potent future problems like we had with Cardinal Road. Hopefully, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we're all we're all human. We'll but be in charge of it. We won't right. be relying on the state where there were failures. Right, we're all human, but we uh, we would uh, require certain portions of it that uh, uh, the elevator actually gets reviewed by the state elevator. And when the elevator inspector caught it, the state elevator inspector went to the, to the building uh, plan reviewer in a different location of the state. Uh, that's when it came to light and things got handled inappropriately, obviously. But we'd, we'd, be, we'd be able to handle that better in-house, understanding the concept. Yes. Process. Yes. Okay, other questions for Bill? I just wanted to add, too, that we're talking about uh, something that would be a benefit to the development community as well as uh, uh, residents who who have been kind of uh, reviewed because the state process is taking how long? Right now, during the summer, it went anywhere from 6 to 12 weeks. So if you had a project that was ready to go, there were, during the major portion of the busy time of the summer, um, it was three-month delay just to get plan review. So... Uh, there's extra fees associated with early start, and there's risks that if the plan is not approved and, and things have to be changed, it could be as much as tearing up footings and foundations and, and moving portions of the building. So it could be a tremendous expense. Fortunately, we haven't run into it, but uh, uh, that is part of what can be offset by, you know, what we're hoping to accomplish. So. Yeah, the builders have been clamoring for it. It will be at least cost neutral, if not uh, making some money. Right. Okay. Right. Okay, I need a motion. Move approval. Need a second. Con concept approval. Concept approval. Okay, any other uh, questions? Do you want this to be in resolution form? No, I don't think it's necessary. We're going to see it again when we get to the point of hiring people and okay, amending so ordinances. Something required by the state for a formal just an agreement I'll bring the documents okay. in and and we'll make yeah. sure all those yeah. still have to be approved now, this is we, we might call this a comfort resolution without a resolution but but it is I think satisfactory given all the remaining steps that have to take place Thank you. any other question or comments otherwise all those in favor of the motion say aye, aye. 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 anyone opposed so the motion passes unanimously we are on to the ordinances. First reading, final action may be taken upon approval of motion to suspend the rules under section 1.07 of Milton General Ordinances. Number one, an ordinance to require sign postings for public hearings on rezoning, conditional use, and variance application, and to provide zoning protest procedure. I think Abby needs to speak first yes, before Abby. there's a motion. Go ahead. Um, we need this item to be referred back to plan commission because any revision to the zoning code um, requires a class two public hearing um, to be held before the plan commission. So we would need a referral to plan commission for that. We also need a referral back to LNO um, because I learned, I got an update from Alder West after the meeting and learned that they would like to see more information about what the sign posting is going to look like and also the the total scope of the fees associated with that so referrals back to those two okay I would move that we refer this item to plan commission and LNO second okay any questions or comments yes Robert we did talk about 
whether the hundred feet uh, was a large enough dispersion area to kind of let people know. And it's like if you're doing something on a house, that's one thing. Doing something on a really big project, let's say you got a big box store, for instance, you know, hundred feet out from a big box store, you know, doesn't get to all the people who a big box store would affect. And I guess I was not, I was not there at the LNO meeting. But if there is any chance to kind of look back at that, um, I know we had talked about that in council chambers when this issue came up during the summer. Um, is, there, is there any chance to go to something that, that kind of changes the, 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 the area of information or notification based partly on either the size of the, the, the thing being done or, or give something else that kind of gives us a little bit of flexibility <coughs> in, in how far we disperse that notification. Abby, I think you can answer some of that because we do more than that now. Okay, and, right. and thank you for educating me. By practice, we do 250 feet because we don't take the time to measure the right-of-way and you're, you're supposed to exclude the right-of-way from your um, public notification. But for a big box store, we have a separate big box ordinance which requires notification at 3,000 feet from the It also the parcel. requires a public hearing before at the very beginning <coughs> plan approval process. Just a related question, um, and different communities do it different ways. Um, does the city collect from the applicant the estimated cost, or do they bill the cost of the public notice separately to the applicant, or do we just charge them a flat fee? It's a flat application fee. Might and I suggest that when you look at that, you know, I, just so you understand my perspective, if you charge a flat fee, it's either going to be too much or too little. Yep. The odds are it's normally going to be too little, which means instead of the person who is trying to change the status quo bearing the cost, all of the taxpayers in the city bear the cost. And I am a big advocate for whenever there is someone changing the status quo, they be, and there are costs like this, that they bear those costs. So. I, when whoever's talking about this again, you've heard from me that that's what I like. It's not the law, this is a policy, but it's a really, it's a, I, in my opinion, it's a much better policy rather than having your budget, the planning budget, bearing the cost, Larry, the unbudgeted costs of public hearings and public notice. That's what LNO was thinking about in terms of the fees. We want the developer to pay for it not the taxpayers. Yeah, and I, and I intentionally didn't use the word developer because or whoever it could be, have to be a developer. just someone changing Applicant, the zoning right. on one lot. Applicant. Yeah. Well, Ellen, Ellen o, um discussed in our last meeting going through and, and looking at those fees and with this with this uh, zoning signage. So there'll be, there'll be some changes coming along. And um, the fees that we have currently, um, Eileen and I sat down and we tried to calculate, you know, on an average how much staff time we're spending and also the cost of um, the signage, and which are reusable, and then also the public notification. And Larry's exactly right. You know, on some smaller projects, $300 might be... more easily separate out the cost for the public notice and then build those separately. So I, I think that that's something that we need to look at. Oh. Okay, so the motion is to refer it to Land Commission and LNO. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So the motion passes. So the next one is uh, ref rules. The first one is the University Avenue Cayuga Park reconstruction, design issues related to the fire station. I'll move approval as recommended by Public Works. Okay, need a second? I'll second that. But okay, all right. Now the questions? Yeah, just a little bit of background. This all of a sudden <coughs> might appear. What the heck is this in front of people? Um, the um, 
portions of University Avenue are going to be rebuilt this summer, and the portion that we're talking about here is the portion that runs from, oh, basically, uh, Parmenter Street west to Cayuga, and it butts, uh, butts the fire department. Is there a picture up there? You, you should have one now. Yeah. If things are working okay. Well, I don't have the power on. That's why it don't work. <laughs> um, mm. And we had a, Here it a is. very spirited discussion at um, the fire commission, of which I sit on, uh, in regards to the fact that um, they would would appreciate the city's participation in a number of improvements mm -hmm. um, in front of their facility. Um, they wrote a letter. I don't know if there's a copy of it in here or not, but they listed nine yes, that's in here. nine different things which they would appreciate the city give consideration to uh, doing when when we reconstruct the road. Public Works took it up last night, and um, um, correct me if I'm going to be wrong here, Joanna. I looked at it in two different fashions. Number one, there were issues that they asked to be resolved that were uh, public works related, pedestrian or uh, traffic related issues, solely that way. Uh, and then <clears throat> that's bucket number one. Bucket number two was all the rest of the stuff that they'd thrown in the list, which asked for gray concrete and a bunch of other things. No. <laughs> Snow banking. You could you went across University Avenue you could, to do that. And dumping water on the road. You yeah. can you can read. So last night, um, the public works went through it item by item, and gave our opinion. Okay, and I have not had chance to read this yet, but I assume Sean wrote this. Yes, I did best uh, I could from uh, <laughs> from my understanding of our robust discussion. And, and so uh, I would I would support. The, uh, the motion that uh, Joanna has made that we simply uh, approve of the uh, recommendations that came out of Public Works. Any other questions or comments? Okay, all those in favor of this motion say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The motion passes. So the next one is the committee appointments, yeah. and uh, there's a vacancy on the Public Safety Committee, and uh, there was a Robert Stipovich, and he moved to Madison. And this actually had been open for uh, some time. And uh, so Ralph Zeno, you probably some of Howard probably know him well. So a well, lot more than just Howard. Oh, OK. Pulls <laughs> back to Larry. <laughs> OK. A couple of the old timers out here. So I have talked to him, came Anybody across. Agree here no, Ralph Zeno. Came across really well. He was on the city council. He also was the oh, first one to oh, put the city code on the internet, and he. I'll move the for all over as I know. Okay, need a second. I'll second. Any questions or comments? All those in favor of the motion of approving Ralph to the Public Safety Committee say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Need a motion? Yeah. I would like to, on this form, it mm -hmm. would be helpful have why they want to be on a specific committee okay. or what skills they might bring to it. You can't necessarily get that out of what they fill out. Yeah, okay. Thank you. We can, I can talk to you. And Okay, need a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Okay, we are adjourned. Thank you, guys.